to them? They went crazy. They believed the lie. And so what happened is they started calling their police departments and asking for gas masks. Did you know that? They called their electric company and turned, told them to turn the power off so the aliens couldn't find them. They ran into churches and they were shouting things like, the end is nigh, right? The, the world is, is over, you know, like Henny Penny and Ducky Lucky, right? The sky is falling. All because they were believing a lie. There were reports of suicide because they were believing a lie. They didn't know it was simply a radio broadcast and they thought it was the news. And so believing a lie wreaked havoc on them and it does the same with you and I. Look how Paul compares truth and error in Galatians 3.1. He says this, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That word is hypnotized. Or who has, who has mesmerized you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. That's the truth, right? That's the message. Paul, in essence, had verbally painted a picture for them to look at of the fact that Jesus died that they could live, that Jesus gave up his life that they might live forever and be forgiven and pardoned and be made new. He painted this picture and they believed it. And two things happened. They came out from under the old covenant law. And the second thing is they got the Holy Spirit. And then look what he says in verse 2. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? In other words, the message of the cross comes with power. It comes with the Holy Spirit. If you believe it, you receive divine, supernatural power for living your life. Whereas they were saying you need to obey. Well, they didn't get the Holy Spirit through their obedience. And so he's calling them to compare. Was it the message you heard or was it your obedience to the law that gave you the Spirit of God? If this message is left out, it is false teaching. That's how you can recognize it. If the message of the cross is left out, it's false teaching. Guess what? Even if it comes from the Bible. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, do you guys remember the dude down in Waco, Texas? Right? He taught the Bible. How about the guy Jim Jones in Guyana? He taught the Bible. Here's what it's like. Somebody comes to you and they say, hey, uh, I want you to read this Old Covenant passage, Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. You can read it for yourself. You can see that you're to obey God. See, it's right there in the Bible. Now, that would be like me coming to you and showing you a law that says you are absolutely prevented from spitting your gum out on the sidewalk. Did you guys know that's a law? (laughs) That's a law that you should not spit your gum out on the sidewalk. I can show it to you. It comes with a $1,000 fine. That's a law in Singapore. (laughs) It doesn't belong to you. You're not under that law. I'm not advocating you go spit all your gum out on the sidewalk. But that doesn't belong to you. You see, Jesus fulfilled the old covenant law on your behalf as if you had obeyed perfectly. And he fulfilled it for you. Thereby, you come out from under that law. You get the spirit whom you now follow who leads you in righteous living. You see, this is the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. So beware. Beware of false teaching that's centered on the law. Beware of it. Yes, you can read it in the Bible. Make sure you're not reading somebody else's mail. That's a, that's a fine as well. And so if we want to run the race well, we have to reject false teaching. False teaching is anything, anything that is not focused on the cross of Christ. Now we know 
false teaching is. Look what Paul calls false teaching in Galatians 5, 9. He says, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Now, he's saying that yeast is a permeating substance and you have a little bit of yeast in your dough and it works through the whole thing. You take a little bit of false teaching and pretty soon it's worked through the whole congregation if you allow it to happen. Beware. Beware of false teaching. He's picking up on what Jesus said in Matthew 16. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread. They're quick, aren't they? (laughs) But against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware, be on your guard, he says, against that teaching. False teaching is very confusing. And so Paul says in verse 10, I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. False teaching is confusing because it goes like this. Let's see. Jesus died to save me eternally, but I have to obey to save me daily. You see, that's confusing. You know, which which is it? And Paul says, in fact, in the last verse, he says, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. And they would discover that it's not obedience to the law that makes a change in the heart. The heart is changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to run well, reject false teaching that will push you off the track. It will distract you. It'll turn you away. Secondly, run with focus. Run with focus. As long as the Galatians were focused on the cross, it, Paul says, you ran well. You were, you were doing well. The wind of the Spirit was at their back. They were picking them up and setting them down. They were progressing ahead in the life. They had perseverance. They continued on because they were focused. What does that mean for you and me? As long as we're looking at the cross, as long as we're feeling the love, experiencing the power, seeing the liquid love flow from the cross because Jesus loved you and died for you. If you focus on that, you'll run well. You'll progress. You'll, make, you'll, you'll actually get somewhere in the Christian life. If you turn away from that, you're going to stumble. We all do, every one of us. You know what happens in Christianity is this. You initially hear this good news. It's so good you can't hardly believe it. But you put faith in it. And then here's what happens. You start looking at how well you're doing. You start thinking about, am I obeying enough? And you start to get this, like this, inwardly focused, right? You're, you're now wondering if you're performing well enough, if you're running fast enough, if you're obeying enough. Am I being faithful? Am I obeying? You can't run while you're looking in here. And this is what typically happens in Christianity is you get inwardly focused. And when that happens, you can't run the race and you can't finish well. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes here means this, to be purposefully preoccupied with Christ. Not looking left, not looking right, refusing distraction at all costs, fixing your eyes on Jesus. That's how to run the race well. And here's three ways to do this, three practical ways to do this. Read your Bible looking for Jesus. Read your Bible looking for Jesus. Secondly, pray to God and ask Him to open your heart and your mind to see the gospel. This is a supernatural book. It can't be understood naturally. Pray and ask God, please open my mind so I can see Jesus. And thirdly, put yourself around wherever Wherever the gospel is taught, put yourself around it. You know what happens with you and me? If we are not having a steady diet of the gospel, 
we get distracted, especially in our day and age. Oh, my word. There's so many things, social media and all kinds of things that will distract us. And I'm not saying this to you because I'm preaching. As you know, we have many teachers. Ted did a wonderful job on Tuesday night at our class. It was phenomenal. Uh, But the point is, you're going to have to fight through coming to church and opening your Bible and praying because those are all spiritual things. And so if you'll push past the gag reflex that your flesh hates to do, you'll be able to feed. Some people say, I already know the gospel. Why do I need to come and hear it? That's like saying, I already know what food tastes like. Why do I need to eat it again today? I just had it yesterday. Well, because you want to be healthy, right? And this is what it takes to be healthy. Study and pray and put yourself around good gospel teaching and that keeps you focused. I'll give you an example. So some of you know that I used to fly airplanes, right? And they taught us something when we went from small single-engine planes to jet airplanes. When you come in for a landing, you have to look all the way down at the end of the runway. Okay? You can't look here like we did in small airplanes because it's going by you too fast. So you come in to land, you're focused at the end of the runway. Well, I used to teach these new guys, these newbies that were just out of training, and they'd come and get on the airplane, and you could always tell a newbie because they were full of themselves. They were overly self-confident. So one time I get this guy, and we're going to land in San Francisco. Some of you know San Francisco has a bay. He's just full of himself, right? So we're coming down. We line up for the runway, and he's like, shh, shh, shh. you know, he's just happy-go-lucky. He's like, oh, look at the wind and the white caps out there. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, look at the, the windsurfers today. They're re-. I'm thinking, how, how do you think this landing is going to go? Now, I don't let him go too far, right? I'm not going to let him hit too hard, but I let this guy some slack because he was so full of himself. So we come down and do this, you know, and several bounces later, and we pull into the gate, and he's like this, right? He's just all depressed and discouraged and red-faced. By the way, if when you're deplaning an airplane, the cockpit door is shut, you know you had a bad landing, right? Because you don't want to see the passengers. So he's, he's all discouraged, and I told him, You need to look at the end of the runway. You're looking left and you're looking right. In Christianity, there's so many things that will distract you. Just watch a YouTube video. Just watch your social media and you'll find some shiny object of theology that will get you all distracted. And you'll go off and you'll have a hard landing because God has given us one message to focus on. And as we do that, we're enabled to run the race well. Look at Paul's focus in Galatians 5.11. By the way, Proverbs 4.25 says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. That's how to live the Christian life. Galatians 5.11, brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. People who want to obey God and gain favor from God through their obedience are offended at the message of the cross because it says you can't be good enough. That's why Jesus had to come and die. And Paul preached that message and he was persecuted for it. And so will you and I be. And I'm willing to stand up and say, that's good. I'm willing to die for this message. I'm very happy to give my life if needed for this message. And that's what Paul said. So he went to places like Lystra and they listened to him preach the gospel and they drug him out of the town and stoned him. Now, you and I would go, we got to get out of here and run. When he came back to himself, he went right back into Lystra and started preaching the message of the cross. That's his focus. That's how focused he was on this message. We might look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. It says this, Jews demand signs. Why? Why would somebody need signs? Their faith is weak, or they don't have any faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
when you hear the gospel and believe it, your faith comes roaring to life. You believe God. You can say, I believe. And Jews demand a sign. And Greeks look for wisdom. We don't just need, uh, you know, King Solomon. We need Socrates and, and Plato and all the rest of them. But we preach Christ crucified. Look at the focus. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But look at this. To those whom God has called. Oh, this is a special message to those whom God has called. It says, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Again, if you were to turn the page into 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul said, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And you think, man, what a one-note Joe. That, that's all this guy has. What, how would you feel listening to the Apostle Paul who said, My message to you today is going to be about the cross of Christ. And everybody's like, well, that's what it was yesterday. He's like, yes, because do you know how big the Bible is? It's all about that message. And so he comes with this message of power and he's focused on it like a laser, not looking left and not looking right. If you want to run the race, you have to reject false teaching and you have to run with focus. And finally, you need to remove all hindrances. You know, there are things that slow us down from running what would you think of a runner who had an overcoat and a briefcase as he run? Okay, you got to remove the things that hinder and the, the sin that so easily trips us up. Those are two categories. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, that's the first category, and the sin that so easily entangles, that's the second category, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So there's things that slow us down and things that trip us up and things that slow us down are not sin. They're not sinful. They just slow down your running. You might think of Netflix or the news or the internet or your devices. Or you can go ahead and fill in the blanks, right? The Seahawks, you know. Uh, or my favorite one, websites that talk about productivity. <laughs> I can waste a whole day on a website talking about how to make me more productive. We have to throw these things off in order to run well, in order to run without any hindrances. And then there's sin, the things that trip us up. Drunkenness and drugs. Sexual impurity, lack of financial integrity, bitterness and unforgiveness, self-righteousness. These things will make it so we can't even run the race if we give in to any one of them. I want to give you an illustration about a man who took this very seriously to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily besets. It's in Genesis chapter 35. It's of Jacob, and God told Jacob, I want you to move and build an altar. And this is what he did. In verse 2 it says, So Jacob told everyone in his household, Get rid of all your pagan idols. Purify yourself, wash yourself, and put on clean clothing. We're now going to Bethel, where I will build an altar to the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress. He has been with me wherever I have gone. Verse 4, look at this. So they gave Jacob all their pagan idols and earrings, and he buried them under the great tree near Shechem. This was a great tree. Okay, It's, it's called a, uh, a uh, I can't think of the name of it, um, but it was a mighty oak, a mighty oak tree. That tree was the spot where all the idols were buried. That tree was where their entire past, the dirty clothing, everything they had from the past was buried. And that tree, you could imagine 
that tree having a special place in their hearts. That's where I got a new life. That's where I buried the old. The old was gone, and now I have a new life. And they're going and building an altar of worship to the true and the living God. So two things happened at that tree. The first one is they got a new start, right? We're dead with the old. We have a new start. The second thing is power happened. Where do we see that? Look at verse 5. As they set out, a terror from God spread over the people in all the towns of that area. So no one attacked Jacob's family. And you think, wait a minute. These towns have trained soldiers. These towns are well protected. And they're afraid of a shepherd man with a family? Yes, he took it seriously to cast off, to throw off everything that hindered and the sin that so easily entangles. All idols were buried at that tree, and God's power came to that family, and terror surrounded the the towns around them. You see what what it takes to experience the divine supernatural power of God. It takes getting serious. The cross of Christ is a very serious event in history where God took your sin and your shame. He put it off of you and put it onto his son. And in so doing, you are free to run. But you now have the opportunity to cast off, to throw off everything that besets, everything that slows you down or trips you up. As you're listening to this right now, I want you to know that God is inviting us today to come to the tree, to come to the tree of the cross. And there he will bury your idols. There he will put to death all your sin. He wants you to throw it off. And I wonder as you're listening to this today, did anything come to your mind? Did anything, uh, the Holy Spirit, bring up anything that you need to throw off? that you need to cast away. You see, God wants to have a family make an impact on our community. And the only way to do that is if we're willing to cast off everything that hinders so that we can run well together. I wonder if there's anything you've thought about uh, as far as slowing you down or tripping you up. If there is, we have a box in the entryway as you leave There's a paper by it and some pens. Would you take and simply write down the things that God brought to mind that you're willing to throw off? As you do that, you don't have to put your name on that. We're going to get those things and pray and simply pray. Maybe a Tuesday night we'll read through them and see that we're, first of all, all together in this All of us have things that have to go. It will be this way for the rest of our lives. It's called repentance, turning away from sin, throwing it off of you, and watch how fast you'll be able to run when you do that. Secondly, it gives us hope. Hope, because we're not encumbered. We're not entangled. The box is called hindrances and entanglements. If you have anything, write it on the piece of paper. Put it in the box. Don't put your name on it. And we'll pray together that God would enable you truly to throw it off and be able to run the race with perseverance. God wants to show his power through a family just like he did in Jacob's time. And he wants to do it through us. So it comes down to this. To run to win means this. Reject false teaching. I hope you know now what is false teaching. Anything not focused on the cross of Christ. Anything that doesn't come from it or come back to it is simply false because it's distracting. Two, run with focus. And three, remove all hindrances. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray just now that you would help us to see the things that have slowed us down. That you would help us to see things that have tripped us up. 
and help us to turn from them and to remove them from us. God, I pray that you would help us to be that family like Jacob who took seriously the command to throw off everything that slows us down. Lord, that your power might be seen in us and that the gospel might go forth with authority and with power and that we might see people hearing it and turning from sin and finding new life at the cross of Christ. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. All righty, so let's stand, please. We'll sing this last song. Um, The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is in the law, but thanks be to God that we have victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Amen. Praise the Lord. When I was listening to Pastor Mike um, give his wonderful gospel message, it the one thing that stood out to me among many is when he says, let us run the race. And when he says, let us throw off the things that hinder us and the sin that entangles us. And I thought, man, this sin that entangled us was wrapped and covered and laid on Jesus. And because it was laid on him, because it was thrown off of us and thrown onto him, and he died and he buried and buried that sin, he buried that guilt, he buried that shame, and he rose. And we rose with him and we have power, the Holy Spirit, and we can now run this race. Focus, looking always to the cross. This marks the end of our worship. I just want to pray for us as we go out and we help others to do the same, look to the cross so they can throw off those things that hinders them, that sin that entangles them, and lay it down at the cross and receive power to live. Lord God, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for this message of power, this message of good news, Lord, the best news this world has ever heard. And the only news this world needs to continue to hear. And we got that message, Lord. May we encounter someone today, tomorrow, this week, that we can share this good news with. But may we also ourselves continue to share this good news with ourselves so we can continue daily to experience this power in our own lives. It's in your name I pray. Amen.